Everybody good? You guys enjoying the conference so far? Yes, it's about the Monty. We're going to be talking about the Monty. I am your host, Mark Clark, your host for today. It's Money Moves Financial Summit. And I'd like to bring to the stage Mr. Paul Taylor. He is the director of the Mayor's Office of Minority and Women-Owned Businesses here in Baltimore City. In this capacity, Paul manages the strategic direction and daily operations of the Mayor's Office of Small, Minority, and Women Business, and is a founding member of the Greater Baltimore Black Chamber of Commerce and a current member of the board, directors of the Baltimore City Chamber of Commerce, Baltimore Development Corporation, Capital Region Minority Supplier Development Council. He's the booger with the sugar. He's the head honcho. He's the top dog. Welcome Paul Taylor to the stage. Oh, Mark, thank Go you Go ahead, so Paul. Much. Thank you, thank you so much. He got much. titles, y'all, he got <laughs> titles. Um, listen, this is, uh, for those of you who have been on some of the other, seen some of the other panels, I hope you've, you've checked it out because the last panel I just listened to was just fantastic. You learned a lot about where some of our next gen developers, some of our next gen real estate investors are here, here in Baltimore. So I, I'm, I hope you all get a chance to hear some of that. Um, Somebody wrote all of that stuff about me. I don't, I don't understand that, but anyway. <laughs> but listen, I, I absolutely am happy to be here today. I'm happy to uh, support this event. This event, for those of you who've enjoyed yourself so far, just, just give a hand clap. I mean, this is fantastic. This, this, is, uh, this is what Baltimore has been waiting for. We're happy to have you here. I, I'm here to just welcome you to this next panel where you're going to hear some more good stuff about what's going on. But if you haven't, Try to get around, try to get to some of the games, try to enjoy yourself. Um, we're very, very happy to have the, the CIAA here in Baltimore showcasing who we are. We're not just the wire, we're a lot more than that. And as you can see, all of the fantastic things that are going on, I hope you got a chance to go to some of the restaurants and, and feed yourself and, and learn something about our crab cakes and we got other stuff, you know. So. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here. Mark, I'm going to bring you back up so that you can do your church thing. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's so right, much. Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Give it up for Paul, y'all. Okay, I'm going to be the moderator for this afternoon's Thinking Outside the Black Box panel discussion. Now, I'm going to be reading the teleprompter, y'all, so stick with me because I'm, you know, reading is fundamental. But we have so many amazing guests that actually are so amazing. We want to make sure that we share with you exactly who they are, okay? Each member of today's panel is an expert in his or her own right. Let me take a moment to introduce you to each of them, all right? Here we go. First, we have Dia Sims the award-winning executive entrepreneur and brand builder extraordinaire. In 2005, she began her 15-year career working alongside Sean Diddy Combs at Combs Enterprises, where she grew within the company while building the multiple brands and businesses under the company's umbrella. In 2017, Dia was named president of Combs Enterprises, making her the first president in the company's 30-year history other than Sean Combs himself. As president, she oversaw multi-billion dollar brands including Ciroc, Ultra Premium Vodka, Blue Flame Agency, Aqua Hydrate, Bad Boy Entertainment, Sean John, and Revolt TV. Most notably, Dia led the transformation of the once unprofitable Ciroc, Ultra Premium Vodka to a $2 billion retail value. All right, <laughs> bottoms up. Currently, she serves as the CEO of Lobos 1707 Tequila and Mezcal, a new independent spirits brand with early backing by sports and cultural icon LeBron James, LeBron James, that launched in 20, November 2020. Additionally, in May 2021, Dia co-founded Proghorn, a 10-year initiative to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion in the spirits industry to help participants within the black community achieve the goal of generating $2 billion in economic value in the U.S. Join me in welcoming Morgan State University alum, Dia Sims, in the building. Dear, it was so great to have you here with your perspective and what you've done. And you, she did that. She did that. Next, we have another HBCU graduate, Nicholas Perkins, representing Fayetteville State and Howard Universities. He is the chairman, president, and CEO of Perkins Management and Fuddruckers with a proven track record of business development. In 2005, at only 24 years old, Nicholas founded Perkins Management Company, which specializes in contract food service management, 
now a multi-million dollar enterprise with multiple business platforms, Perkins Management has a diverse portfolio of clients that include colleges, universities, hospitals, and U.S. Department of Defense. In 2021, Nicholas engineered the $18.5 million acquisition of the Fud Ruckers restaurant brand. Give it up for that. What? Let's give this Omega Man a very warm welcome. I read about this, brother, and I'm meeting him in person. This is what I'm talking about. All right, then we have Tiffany Norwood, founder and CEO of Tribe Tan, which helps organizations and individuals learn how to turn their ideas and goals into reality. She's also a legacy co-founder of Sim Win Sports, which is the first ever digital sports league platform with tokens, online betting, and esports fantasy tournaments that launched earlier this month during the 2020 Super Bowl. Tiffany is considered one of the top innovators in tech entrepreneurs in the world, and recently was named the 2022 Entrepreneur of the Year by her alma mater, Cornell University, make some noise, making her the first black woman in the 40-year history to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award. This goes back as a 19-year-old, she filed a patent and licensed her first software code for a multi-billion dollar bank at the age of 24. Three years later, Tiffany raised more than $670 million to fund a startup called WorldSpace, which launched three satellites into space, built the first ever global digital platform, including XM Radio, and supported, and supported the development of MP3 technology and MP4 technology. With a career spanning 35 years, including eight startups and multiple exits, we're so Grateful to have Tiffany on our panel. Come on up here, Tiffany, amazing. And last but not least, slow it down for me. I'm running out of breath. <laughs> I need oxygen. First of all, give it up for the panel so far, y'all. This is an amazing panel. I'm just glad to be on the panel. Is anybody taking pictures? Please. Thank you. My socks were okay. Lord, why did I wear the boots? Why are the boots today? Okay, bring it back a little bit. Next we have <laughs> former Congressman Harold Ford Jr., who is the chairman and CEO of Empowerment Inclusion Capital I Corporation, which is a special purpose acquisition company with a unique purpose-driven mission to acquire a company making a positive difference in the world and support its ongoing growth and success to create enduring values for all stakeholders. He is currently the Executive Vice President and Vice Chairman of PNC's Corporate and Institutional Banking Group and a Director of Live Oak Acquisition Corporation, a blank check company that was founded in 2020. Thanks for joining us, Congressman, your expertise and uh, your insight. We look forward to and we need it today in our discussion. Look at him, looking good, y'all. AKA the Gray Fox, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> With this all-star lineup, we're really looking forward to have this discussion and find out, you know, where we're going. And you guys are an amazing panel. So let's just dive in. Congressman Ford, I'm gonna kick it off with you. What is a SPAC or special purpose acquisition company? Well, first off, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, and it's great to be on the panel with, with all of these distinguished people. Uh, uh, Baltimore uh, is a special place for really all of us, but particularly uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in the business space and the political space. So much of what has come uh, in terms of good and growth for, for black Americans over the many years, there's a, a great tracing back to this city, uh, being in law, uh, being in business, being in politics, and obviously being in entrepreneurship. So thank you for having me. I, I'm really here because Zach McDaniels told me to be here this morning. That's so, right. Uh, Zach, thank you again for not the invitation, but the demand. Uh, that, that be here Everybody this said same, Zach. <laughs> when he calls, you respond. So I, I've been fortunate um, in my 51 years uh, to have had a chance to, to live out uh, at a very young age, at the age of 26, the opportunity to be in public life and politics. I was elected uh, to Congress back uh, from my home city of Memphis, and I run into a, a, a person or two and a friend or two in the audience who actually voted for me, and I thank you for that and for the, having the honor of having served you. Uh, I served in Congress for 10 years, uh, and I lost a race for the U.S. Senate back in 2006 um, to uh, a fellow named Bob Corker. The Lord works in mysterious ways. For the first time in 16 years, he and I spoke just two weeks ago. He saw me on wow. television. You didn't punch him, did you? We had a great, did you say amen? You didn't punch him, did you? No, I don't, no, 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 I'm, I'm, okay. I'm one of God's children. I, I just listened to him and we had a great, 
we had a great conversation. Uh, but it, 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 I listened to one of the other panelists, and I listened to one of the questions on the panel about how do you think about the future? And there was a young lady that came up to us as we were standing over in the corner asking us, ask us how did you get into the field that you got into and what made you want to pursue the career that you pursued? And I, one of the things that I think about as I answer that question and get ready to answer this back question is, is I love people and I love relationships. And I, the one thing I would encourage entrepreneurs and, and others in the room to do, and certainly the elected officials and Mr. Mosby and others who have already spoken, uh, the power of friendships and relationships and the power of not discarding one or two just because you may have had a difference with he or she um, is really an enduring thing, I think. And one of the reasons that I've been able to generate what little success I've had in my life has been that I've, I've kept these friendships and relationships over the years. This SPAC that I'm the CEO and chairman of is a SPAC that is, is sponsored by my employer, who is also a, a part sponsor today, PNC Bank. Uh, some of my colleagues, I know at least one of my colleagues is in the room uh, this late morning, early afternoon. PNC decided uh, about a year and a half ago after the killing of George Floyd to want to be a part of something sustainable to make a difference, a sustainable difference in trying to redress systemic racism and advance economic equality in communities where the bank has a big footprint. So they joined with Jeffrey's Bank and decided to leverage their capabilities to try to take a company public. And the idea is the company we take public, and that's what a SPAC does. A SPAC is just a blank check company. As crazy as it sounds, we, we raise $275 million. We're listed on a New York Stock Exchange. Our ticker symbol is EPWR. Our SPAC is called Empowerment and Inclusion Capital. And the I on there is confusing. It's Empowerment and Inclusion Capital One because we plan to do a second and a third one after we're, after we're successful with the first one. But our intent is to combine with the company or take a private company public that's worth between $750 million and $2 billion. Uh, and we're going to, I'm sorry, we're going to, uh, my, my wife tells me I talk loud, I really realize I need to put the mic up even closer. We plan to take the company public, and if the company does not have diversity at its founding level or management level or board level, we're gonna pair diversity with the company because we think great companies in the 21st century have, must have diversity, ethnic, uh, racial, gender diversity at all levels of leadership. And then we're going to do something no SPAC has ever done. We're going to give away all of our profits. Uh, we're going to give away all of our profits. PNC will give it to our foundation. And our foundation has already created a sleeve, a massive sleeve in it, which has already been funded by $1.5 billion. PNC sold a stake in a firm called BlackRock about two years ago. We took $1.5 billion of that and decided to devote to a sleeve in our foundation to invest in initiatives around the country, where PNC has a big footprint, and Baltimore is one of those cities invest in initiatives and causes that are seeking to redress racism and advance economic opportunity and equality in those communities. We'll take our same, our profits from this initiative, as will Jeffries, and do the same. So we, we have two years in our spec to complete this, to find a company and close on it. And we are a year into our journey. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies, some interesting. We've seen some companies that were too small. In fact, uh, I saw a, a colleague at the table I was just at who had a a uh, card from his, his own card from a bank called Greenwood Bank, which is a black neo bank in Atlanta. Uh, PNC is a, a, a owner of that bank, a part owner of that bank. We looked at that company to perhaps take public through our SPAC. They were a little too small, but we were so intrigued with what Ryan Glover and Paul Judge and Killer Mike and, uh, and, and, and Mayor Young were doing. The bank decided to make an investment and take an ownership stake uh, in Greenwood. Uh, for all the right reasons. We've invested in an Hispanic bank that looks very similar to Greenwood or has a very similar kind of purpose. And we even invested, I heard, my, I heard Stacy, my, my old classmate, share up here in the first panel about the importance of saving and investing and taking a piece, whether it's $5 or $500 or $5,000 a paycheck and saving and, and beginning to invest. We invested in a woman named Tanya Van Court who runs a company called Goal Setter. Tanya comes from the television, children's television industry and decided to launch a for-profit effort, an app-based for-profit effort to help families introduce their young kids, particularly families that are brown and black, introduce their kids uh, to investing, to financial literacy, and to the power of all the things that, that, that Drew and everyone else on the panel spoke about earlier. Um, I'm not a preacher, but I have, my dad is one of 15 and yes. one was, so I can keep going, but I, I'm <laughs> you, happy to answer more questions. You would be a good one. You would be a great one. Now, <laughs> so we're talking about SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Company, right? Yes, so sir. how do SPACs target companies to acquire? So Maybe someone's out here who would like to be acquired. Anybody want to be acquired? Sure, no? Nobody. Not? Nobody <laughs> wants to be acquired. There's one. 
Only one so, person, one company. So what, 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 a SPAC, what a SPAC, again, we, we raised money. We raised our money. We went public last January. Uh, our company will dissolve from the New York Stock Exchange if we do not combine with the company by January of next year and close the deal. We identify companies by people in our bank give us leads. The big bracket banks, including Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and Bank of America, give us leads. In fact, that young lady you're sitting next to, we had a conversation, I think, with her and her company very early on in this process. And because of the size of our, our the amount of money we have, we're looking, the math of a SPAC, you look to combine with a company somewhere between three to five times what you raise. It's not uncommon because you're able to raise additional funds on the back of the process. But the key to a SPAC is to find a great company to combine with, with a great management team. And our SPAC, we're not looking, it's like some SPACs, they look to displace the management team because they have some expertise and they think mm -hmm. they know what's best. We, we don't come at it that way. We, we want to find a great team, a great company with great growth prospects. I like to consider us, we're looking for a company that sits right at the intersection of growth, uh, inclusion, uh, and philanthropy. Uh, and we're going to find one. Uh, and PNC as our sponsor has been very, very fastidious and serious about ensuring that the integrity of the company, the integrity of the, the financials, the integrity of their, of their accounting and reporting and the auditing uh, of the audited financials are all the right way. So we, we have a, probably a taller burden in some SPACs. SPACs have gotten some negative attention uh, over the last few months. We don't welcome that attention, but we're not ashamed or afraid of it because of the constitution of our SPAC uh, and the strength around it. So, All right. Thank you so much. Let's yes, go to Dia. Now, Dia, you were able to climb your way up the ladder from executive assistant to the president of a multi-million dollar corporation. Now you have a new uh, company, Lobos. You know, tell us about that. Tell us about that. So if you're over 21 years old, I have a, uh, I'm running now a tequila called Lobo 1707. And when you're 21, you can responsibly consume. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's interesting, I started I started here locally. I went to Morgan. I don't know if it's a coincidence, all the blue and orange for CIAA, but go, any, any bears in the room, go Morgan. Um, no bears in the room? What is I, going I, on? I see a couple bears in the room. They're um, quiet bears. <laughs> um, so I, um, I think, you know, just to, to, to tap into the congressman's uh, point is uh, the spirits industry is one of these industries that is extremely, uh, we're, we're very underrepresented in, right? Minorities, women, well, like, like, like much of American industry. And um, I started to get a little bit of taste in the industry in my 20s a very long time ago, right here, running a small company where I would hire promotional models to go into like liquor stores and local cruises and like, oh, would you like to try this Crown Royal or whatever was my first introduction into it. And then when I then went to work with um, Sean Combs or Puff Daddy or Diddy or Brother Love or Love or <laughs> what time is it? I don't know what he's calling himself right now. Uh, for 14 years, um, I really got some, some, some real instruction in the industry when we began working on the, a brand called Ciroc Vodka. This brand had been with the biggest supplier in the world, Diageo, incredible company, huge multi-billion dollar company, but they couldn't get it right. Five years, it was not doing well. And when we got into relationship with them, um, we brought a level of entrepreneurship, of understanding an audience that was either being neglected or being underspent in. Um, and I think just brought a different level of energy to the industry that built that brand to at its height. It was about $2.6 billion value brand, right? Still doing well today. Um, again, if you indulge, don't hesitate to get Ciroc Vodka on your shelf. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then from there, uh, you, you, you stand around Puff long enough, you're going to want to figure out how to own something, right? So <laughs> that entrepreneurial bug certainly jumped on me. And I, I now am working alongside incredible luminaries like LeBron James and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Draymond Green. Um, and we've recently launched a brand called Lobo 1707 Tequila. Um, we're coming up on about 12 months of uh, sales, and we are tripling our forecast. So again, if you, if you look, I tell everybody, look in your pantry, look at your bar, and be intentional about, are, are the brands owned by women? Are they owned by black and brown people? Um, I am all about voting in elections, but don't forget to vote with your wallet um, as well when you make choices. And, and, to, and one last point, um, I, we recently co-founded an initiative called Pronghorn. And um, what we have built is a template on how to effectively diversify really any industry. 
uh, it's heart led, but it is math based and it's commercially forward, right? Because the best commercial for diversity is actually commercial success. It's building successful brands. Um, we're starting with the spirits industry and we're starting with the black community in the United States. We'll be investing in 57 black owned companies over the next 10 years. And we are going to be looking to hire 1,800 new black employees in the spirits industry at large across all the companies like a Pernod Ricard, like a Diageo, like a Brown Foreman, like a Moe Hennessy. The average employee at a supplier makes about $99,000 and they drive about $1.2 million of top line revenue. So this initiative is good for the black community and it is good for the industry at large. This is a $353 billion industry. Whether you drink or you don't drink, we deserve a seat at the table up and down the ranks because we're represented on one side of the bar and absent on the other. And and the intent of Pronghorn is to change that entirely. Amazing, amazing. And again, you know, you guys are in this room in front of these amazing people. Don't be shy. Don't have regrets when you're driving back. I should have said something. I got an idea. You know, if you get a chance to, make sure you do that because that's what this is all about. Opportunity, you know, it's also all about. Okay, Nicholas. Now, Nicholas, I'm not going to sit here as a partner in a beverage company, a delicious beverage tea and lemonade, and try to get, get on because that would be gauche. But I'll let your boy after this. No. <laughs> Nicholas, congratulations <laughs> on your recent acquisition of Flood Records. I read all about Thank it. You. May you please tell us about the various types of acquisitions and their respective benefits, then take us through your experience in this space. And then one more time, let's give it up for Nicholas. Come on now. <laughs> this young brother right here, doing it like that. Thank you very much. I, I must say that uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, Zach invited me to be here, but you know, I, I absolutely have to say that uh, I, John Lewis is here in the room from the Harbor Bank of Maryland. Zach, Mr. Ed Brown is not here, but I wouldn't be here if it had not been for those three brothers. Wow. Um, you know, I had a vision, you know, uh, after uh, 2019, which is a bit rough year for Perkins management, that I wanted to diversify my company and uh, spent a lot of time, free time, with Zach. And Zach then began to introduce me uh, to people. And, you know, he said, you know, you, you may need to approach this thing a little differently. Uh, some people would probably sit on the stage and, you know, you know, you know take part in a lot of self-grandizement, but I absolutely have to say that I would not be here had it not been for people like them uh, who helped to guide me and provide uh, very valuable uh, guidance on how to approach this, but I had a vision uh, to acquire uh, the Lubies Corporation, which is a cafeteria uh, company that was based in Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lubies has had uh, experienced a significant amount of financial trouble. Uh, they were the, also the parent company who owned Fuddruckers, and Lubies was going to go through a divestiture and sell off all of their assets. And uh, so when I initially started the process, we thought that the acquisition would be around $200 million. So we then began to start that process of going after the entire corporation, but um, you know, wound up not being able to purchase the entire company. But uh, you know, you, I believe that you always wind up with what you're supposed to have. Mm. And so although I did not uh, win the Luby's bid, I was successful of 149 other companies uh, to have acquired uh, Fuddruckers, which made me the first African-American to own 100% of a national All right. franchise. So uh, very happy and delighted to have been able to do that. But uh, I'm a rookie whenever it comes to this whole idea of, uh, of acquisitions and that whole process. I had never had any experience in that. Uh, but uh, Mr. Brown uh, from Brown Capital Management <laughs> and Keith Lee from Brown Capital Management, Ms. Lloyda Lewis, all gathered around me and, uh, and I pressed forward and did the work. Um, and, uh, you know, people spend millions and millions of dollars just on due diligence. Well, I couldn't make that type of investment in a pandemic during COVID trying to save a company that was in the food business to keep it alive. So I had to hunker down, if you will, and called on my resources from Howard University and others, and we all gathered around the table and we figured out how to get it done. So man, it's a blessing. Man, man, you know what you got? One more time, y'all, give it up and to talk about <laughs> leaning on, standing on the shoulders of those who came before us, 
again, Reginald Lewis has to be smiling today. Yeah, absolutely. Let's give it up for Reginald Lewis, y'all. We in Baltimore. Come on now. Congratulations. And also that partnership piece, that working together piece. Yeah, that, I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, Tiffany, innovation is your thing. Over the past three and a half decades, you have been the chief innovator in your current capacities. You are transforming education and disrupting sports. But throughout your career, you have always embraced your imagination, which has catapulted you to become one of the world's innovators and tech entrepreneurs. Tell us, Tiffany, what is innovation and how do you transform an idea into a business? And shout out to you as a young person. You are already doing it. We talked about you talked about dreams when we were off, off stage. But tell us about innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today. Um, Zach made the same call to me, <laughs> like in November, and I was like, I don't know, we're launching the sports platform, I do, there's so many things going on. He was like, oh great, thanks, you'll be there. <laughs> um, I also have to say, I, uh, it was just announced uh, a few days ago that I'm the 2022 Entrepreneur of the Year for Cornell University. Thank yes. you. And in the 40-year history of this Lifetime Achievement Award, I'm the first black woman. So to have my first live talk, really since the pandemic, in person, like I've done a lot of talks on Zoom, and to be sitting up here and looking at all these black faces in the audience, and especially my sisters, like black women, makes me so proud. All right now. <laughs> I'm getting really emotional. And I just want to tell you that I will not waste this platform. We have more than 230,000 alums around the world living, um, and they decide to give me this platform for the year, and I want to be held accountable because I will not waste the platform. And I realized even more how big of a deal it was when my alma mater, Harvard Business School, was reaching out to me and like, wow, what a big deal. I'm like, whoa, they, they never reach out to me for anything. So um, I, I was told, I haven't verified, that I was the first black woman of all the Ivy Leagues to get this kind of award. Thanks. And she's here with us, y'all. History in the making. Yeah. We were here. We were here. We were here. So this, this is a, a very proud moment to sh uh, for me to share with you all. Um, I have, uh, I started my first company when I was 19 and, and filed for my first patent, actually while I was still a student at Cornell back in the 80s. And um, ironically, even though I'm a technologist and inventor and very big tech, you know, um, the first patent I filed for was for, with friends, was for the one strap backpack. So we had invented the one strap backpack, you know, where the bag sort of is like a triangle and tapers to the top and clicks on either side. Um, and it went to, we all sling our backpacks over one shoulder and we were like, why isn't there a one strap backpack? Um, so that was the first thing, it was like taking your ideas and imagination seriously and being like, we're gonna file a patent for it, right? Like who, who does that, especially back then? But you have to have that level of importance placed on your imagination. And when we launched that company back in the 80s, we raised about $5,000. $5,000 meant more back then. <laughs> um, and with that, we launched the company, we got the patent, we ended up in 50 retail outlets, including Spike Lee's joint, which was, which was the big deal for me back then, and, and Brooklyn, uh, New York Times, like just a lot of coverage around it. But from that one moment, um, I learned so much about business and like the practice and operations of business. So I encourage you all to you know start something if not 
to have it be a career, just to understand how it all fits together, how it fits taking your imagination seriously and then bringing it into reality through storytelling and collaboration and finding your believers like you did, right? Like I didn't have, I come from very, you know, very middle class, you know, working uh, parents background. They, they didn't put any money in the 5,000. They were still just trying to figure out how to pay for Cornell. You know, my mom was an economist and she literally took a second job being a greeter at Kmart to help fill in that gap while we were doing it. So like you, it's like through storytelling, through finding your believers and tribe, you can do so much. That is your initial wealth. I like to say you are a billionaire in the currency of faith and connection, and you can literally spend it with storytelling, right? Like that's how you, you transact. And so from that and learning all of that, um, I then a few years later, did a startup, it was a satellite, the first global satellite radio platform back in the 90s, before there was even such a thing as space entrepreneurs. Um, and we had the idea of launching three satellites to cover every country on Earth. It's that the world could speak to the world and we were like, it's gonna transform everything. And we needed to raise nearly a billion dollars to do it because building and launching satellites are very expensive. And so I went out as a 27-year-old with micro braids down the middle of my back. So never let anyone tell you how to wear your hair. Seriously, I'm like, never tell me how to wear my hair. This was in like 96. And raised the first round $670 million. To this date, I do not know another entrepreneur, black, white, male, female, young, old, that has raised that much money for a standalone startup, period. Okay. We then launched those three satellites. And keep in mind, before, my startup before that was the Backpack Company. <laughs> Seriously. And then before that, it was the lemonade stands and all that sort of stuff. It's a very direct line around practice, 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 fall down, get up, fall down, get up, just keep going, right? I like to say um, I filter everything out, I keep my eyes on God, and I just don't stop, right? Anyone can do that. Before I did extraordinary things, I walked you know, like I walk down the street and I still walk down the street and no one's like, oh, wow, she's extraordinary. Like we all have that potential within us. Even for me, like sort of, it took me about eight months to raise the money. So like nine months before, if you had told me I was going to raise that money and start building and launching satellites, I would have been like, nah, <laughs> you know. Um, and not only do you get a chance to you know, support yourself and make money and build wealth, which I still have a lot to learn on that, so I'll speak to you because a lot of frontier tech entrepreneurs, we are definitely the sort of people that put all our eggs in one basket, right? right. <laughs> um, uh, and as I get older, I need to uh, definitely, you know, move away from that more. Um, but um, when, when you do these things, um, it really is just one step at a time and one story at a time and one believer at a time. And uh, from that, you can do very, very large things, including right now, I have two startups, as was mentioned. Uh, one is called Trebetan, where I've created, uh, it's an ed tech company. We use technology and content and videos and music and animation to teach the Tibetan method, which is my process for taking your imagination, turn it to reality, that's very accessible for all of us, like your story, right? Where it starts with the imagination, it starts with the story and finding your believers versus it's versus the typical model is it starts with the VC and getting $5 million, which not all of us have access to, but we can get to that point. And then the other startup I have um, is Simwin Sports, which was the original uh, founder of it is David Ortiz, not Big Poppy, but <laughs> my favorite David Ortiz, the, the gamer, also a black founder, started at Atari. We had parallel career tracks, but him and 
and gaming, part of uh, the Madden franchise game. So back in the end of 2015, he called me up, so I was the second co-founder, um, and said, Tiff, God, I have this idea, like v VR eSports League platform, are you in, do you wanna do it? I'm like, I'm in, let's do this. So this is six years ago. We were a bit too early with the VR part of it, but not with the eSports League and the blockchain part. So at the 2022 Super Bowl, we uh, launched Simwin Sports. It started as Immortal Sports. Uh, Simwin then came along in 2019, acquired Immortal, and I would love to show you all the first ever digital sports league platform in the metaverse with blockchain and nifties. Can you show the vi video, please? Give it up, y'all, for Tiffany. I know one thing, you need to we need to attach to that train, because you know that's going all the way to the top, baby. Awesome, awesome. So we're gonna hop back to the congressman, uh, you know, transitioning back to SPACs. What are the risks associated with SPACs? So, a big transition here. That was outstanding, <laughs> by the way. That's Congratulations amazing. Thank to you. you. Um, uh, Zach, I think we, one of the conversations we were having about Mr. Bell, I think you found perhaps someone she should, uh, she should talk to. Um, the legal risk of SPACs. Um, if, if, if your company, again, one of the reasons we're so focused on the integrity of the company we want to combine with and we are so focused on the management team and uh, the integrity associated with them, uh, a lot of SPACs have gotten in trouble because they've not done the diligencing on the company and not done the things that he did at, 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 at Fuddruckers to make the company to ensure, I mean, you've got to, you've got to build, build that team around you to make sure that, um, uh, that you're crossing, crossing your T's and dotting your I's. I'll just say this, the best thing for me being head of this SPAC and the thing that gives me most confidence is that PNC is our partner. Um, they are not wanting to do a deal that's a bad deal. Uh, they're willing to forfeit the at-risk capital if we can't find a good deal. You find some SPACs that are doing deals that they shouldn't be doing. They're taking companies public. They're not ready to go public, uh, all because the sponsors are looking to cash in uh, themselves because the economics for sponsors and SPACs are generally advantageous. Our SPAC, again, the thing that makes us most unique is that we're giving away all of our economics. So sponsors take 20% of the economics in a SPAC. All of our economics are being given to charities hmm. and initiatives uh, that, again, are going to re seeking to redress racism and advance economic equality in cities like Baltimore and Detroit and Philadelphia, Atlanta, Washington, Chicago, where, and, and increasingly in Texas where uh, PNC has a big footprint. But I want to hear about the metaverse. I, mean, I know. I, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm not sorry talking about, about legal risk, but and that was again, a, I, Tiffany, once again, give it up for what you just saw <laughs> as, we, as we saw a glimpse into the future, and uh, Tiffany and I talked about this off stage, but it just, it's amazing because it's not, the beauty of the future is it's not about age. It could be, you know, it, we're moving into the future regardless if you're 80 years old or if you're four years old, and that's so exciting. And again, I want to give you, a, once again, give it up for Tiffany, that's amazing. <laughs> wow. All right. At the Super Bowl, 50 Cent performed right after, because we were the night before the, <laughs> the event, and I'm like, ah, I wish 50 Cent would like drop down and start performing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nicholas and Dia, as HBCU graduates, what advice would you give to the current HBCU students and recent graduates who wish to take similar career paths but don't know where to start or lack the confidence to take the necessary steps to embark on this journey? I have two at HBCUs right now. I'll listen. 
Um, so uh, one, I just want to, the confidence piece is important, and I say this all the time, is all humans have shared 99.5% the same genome. So aliens were looking at us, they'd be like, why are these ants arguing like they're all the same, right? So <laughs> the important part of that is to know that the capacity for abundance and greatness is literally within all of us. It's not hyperbole, it's not just a fun, random speech. It, like, scientifically is actually within you. So you belong in every room, and every bit of data shows that Rooms are better, not philosophically better. You make more money, you have more innovation, you have better retention when you have more women and you have more diverse people in the room. Can you hear me okay? No, no, oh, go sorry. ahead. Yeah. Um, so I think, I would, I would say to any HBCU graduate, like stand on the confidence that you are driving legitimate value when you walk into the building, one. And then two, there are so many industries I just didn't know about. No, I, my parents are very smart. I just didn't know there was a job to be a master of whiskey, right? So it's important to be a lifelong learner and ask questions and whatever you already like to do, you can probably be paid for, but you do have to do the upfront work and, and do the research to find the right path. And lastly, and I'll, I'll turn it to Nicholas, is, um, it is important to get that internal experience, get the exposure, get the right training, but do consider entrepreneurship as a path forward. One of the reasons, um, or one of the guiding lights when we launched Pronghorn was, we looked at the research, and I didn't know this, but I say it every time I can, but the average white American is worth 13 times what the average black American is worth today. When you pull out business owners, that multiple drops to three times, which I was like, well, that's incredibly good news to know that today, in the midst of the amount of inequities we have systemically, it's already that difference is great. When you double click on that population, the average black American who owns anything at all is typically worth 12 times what the average black American who owns nothing. You don't have to start the next Amazon. You and your crew can get an Airbnb and rent it out. If you go to a nail salon all the time, put a little cash in, participate in their dividends. If you go to the same bakery for cakes, you can invest. But you can get on, you can get, get your, go to PNC and get your portfolio started. But own something because it is the difference maker in the long run. And if you are an HBCU graduate and you are you know, in your 20s, and this was said in the last panel, the time is absolutely now. Yes. So having had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, two great HBCUs, one of which is competing in the championship uh, today, later on tonight, Fayetteville State University, if I'm not mistaken, um, and, and, and Howard University, where I've had the uh, absolute pleasure over the past three years of serving also as an adjunct professor of entrepreneurship in the School of Business something that's near and dear to my heart that I make time for. And um, I have had the opportunity to teach over 200 students. And I always say to them to dream beyond the current uh, resources that you currently control. You know, the first step in the entrepreneurial process is to do that. Uh, many people don't understand uh, the social and economic challenges that our students face uh, day in and day out, uh, unique situation for me is that I've spent the past 16 years of my entrepreneurial career providing food services to HBCUs, donating millions of dollars in scholarships, so I work very closely with them, and I understand the unique challenges that our students face, and I always encourage them to dream beyond the existing uh, resources that you currently control. Myself, uh, as an undergraduate student, took football took me to Fayetteville State University. And when I stopped playing football, I went to work in the food service. And I learned absolutely everything that I possibly could about the food service business. And that's, that's what motivated me. Uh, I was a student in the business school. And, you know, I, I learned to merge my two passions, which was cooking and, and, and meal preparation to business and entrepreneurship. And that's kind of molded and shaped my career thus far. And so, you know, I, I'm very grateful to PNC for something that they did that had not been talked about today. And that is the initiative that they put together to invest in uh, minority business entrepreneurship all over the country, uh, starting at Howard University as the, uh, the, the, the main uh, school that will lead and then all the satellites, Clark Atlanta and the other institutions that will help to promote 
minority entrepreneurship and minority business development all over the country. As our racial wealth gap continues to, to grow, uh, entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is the way for us to narrow that gap. We've tried a lot of things. We, we teach our kids to go out and get jobs and do all these things, but our racial wealth gap still continues to grow. So I teach my students to focus on entrepreneurship and use entrepreneurship as a tool to create generational wealth and pass that wealth along. I had an opportunity, and I'd be remiss if I didn't speak to this, uh, to watch the panel before me, so many dynamic people. And, uh, and, and it was very interesting to me to hear their perspective. And I'd like to offer an alternative to perspective to some things that some people may not fully understand. I have employed a thousand plus employees at a time. Many of these people I watched raise families off a dish room salary, okay? And day in and day out, <clears throat> maybe didn't even have, a, had to make a decision about paying a light bill or buying groceries. So I want people to understand something. People are not always in the situation that they're in because of negligence or apathy. Sometimes people aren't able to save and invest because they literally are trying to just get through the day. People oftentimes will judge African-American people and the decisions that they make and not fully understand that we aren't always playing, uh, we don't have, we, we're, not, we're not starting from the same starting point, right? You know, you know, there are times where people are not are denied opportunity, denied access, and you know, they aren't conscientiously making a decision not to do things. Life happens sometimes to people. So I've, I've had the benefit of working around all different types of people from all different walks of life, all earning potential, but I never lost the common touch. And I think that is so important that you never ever lose the common touch as it pertains to people. So, and I see that on our, on, on our campuses and I instill that to our, our students, especially those at Howard who think they know everything in the world. <laughs> okay, you can't tell them, you can't teach them, you can't tell them nothing, they know more than you do. But I love them to death. But, uh, but, but invest in our institutions. Invest in our institutions of higher learning. Invest in our, our students because they really are our future. Thank you. Wow. Look, our time, you know, our time is running short, but, but you know, before we conclude, I'd like to allow our panelists to share any final thoughts. Okay, well, let's, let's start at the end down there with the great Fox. So, so <laughs> the, um, uh, Nicholas, thank you for pointing out one of the, 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 the initiative at PNC where we're deploying the one and a half billion dollars. The very first effort was an eight-figure uh, uh, donation and investment uh, the first entrepreneurial center in, the, in all of the HBCU universe is on the Howard University campus, uh, and our regional president in, in Washington, D.C., and the head of our, F, head of our corporate responsibility at, at all of the bank is a, a Washingtonian and made, made, made it his purpose and intentionality to make that happen. Um, I'll echo exactly what Nicholas said. Prioritize relationships, uh, but don't, don't grade relationships. When I moved from Merrill Lynch to Morgan Stanley, I'll never forget, the person who handled the top floor at Merrill Lynch where the executives' offices were and the cafeteria for the executives were had moved to Morgan Stanley. And I get to Morgan Stanley and I go up to the elevator and I see him. I hadn't seen him in, in a year or so. I hug him. I come back from the meeting I was going. He had everybody on the floor to meet me that ran the floor, the people who really managed the floor, the people who actually ran the private dining room, the people who ran the copy room. They said, I want you to know this is our guy. Um, you treat people the same. Uh, I don't care what title, what kind of title someone has in front of them, because you never know that dishwasher may be CEO. You never, you never know that dishwasher may be the one when you go in that restaurant who actually has to ensure that your dishes are clean, or it might be the person running that restaurant. So your, every story here has been so wonderful, and I can't wait to six o'clock to enjoy what a 21-year-old enjoys. Person who's over 21, I miss Diaz. I think about your products. Later Cheers. Today. So Salud. thank you again. <laughs> Do you mind if I go last? Because I'm going to close with a poem. Okay, and then we're, we're going we're to take a few questions after, after you know. This, so, um, do you want to go to? Sure. Yeah, I think that um, don't miss out on where we are right now. This is um, I'm so proud to have CIAA in this wonderful city, and yeah. just yeah, right. Like it's a big deal. It's a big deal, and um, I think when I when I came in today, I was 
you know, just a little bit like overwhelmed just to see all these beautiful people and over here just great conversations. Um, you know, relationships are, are, can start right now today. And you know, one thing I always encourage is if you're great at something, you're an accounting major or marketing major, but all your friends are also in the same field, meet some people in a different field. Like you wanna have a crew or at least access to people who have skills that you don't have. And we have a, a room right now, a platform, an entire city of opportunities to make those new relationships as you start to plan out your life. So I hope um, that these panels are useful, but a lot of times you can get the your lifelong information, your lifelong relationships from somebody at the next table, somebody in the hallway. So don't, don't take this chance for granted. And, uh, and I would say that um, every black family should have a business in it. I don't care yes. what it is. Uh, I don't care how, how big or small. Uh, when you look across the legacy of, of, of African Americans in, in our country, uh, m many of us uh, were forced to become entrepreneurs because of the situation and circumstance. And in some instances, we've strayed away from that. So uh, I'd like to see us get more uh, involved in uh, a business and, and, and entrepreneurship. And I just believe that because of the way that our tax uh, system is structured, uh, you know, every African American uh, uh, family should have a business in it strictly because of that. Mm. Amen. And Tiffany with a poem. Yes, I'm gonna close with a poem called Hermione Rising. Hermione Granger from Harry Potter, one of my favorite characters because she was told she was a muggle and had no magic and really she was better than Harry. But also in London, I don't know if people here know that when they did the live show, uh, she was cast, uh, which was them as adults. She grew up to be a black woman. So a black woman played her in the live show. Um, I'll also say, Nicholas, what you close with is so important because in every society, we have the dream doers, the dream supporters, and the dream killers. So at the very least, decide not to be a killer and to be a supporter if you're not gonna be the doer. So Hermione rising. I imagine something new, something different. I imagine a better way, something disruptive and innovative, used and revered, demanded and paid for, something transformative. Imagination, why do we deny it and discount? It's the source of all innovation. Einstein was theoretical, not applied. Da Vinci, an artist and a scientist. George Washington Carver, no vision, no hope. And Harriet, well, Harriet had to have imagined freedom before she took the first step. I have a dream of traveling space, of curing cancer, of running for office, of peace, unity, equality, and equity. You get what I'm saying? It's not about the how, it's about the why, the sense of purpose. No need to teach imagination, just endorse it. And with grace, give space for it. It's not to be packed away, it should be on display in schools and offices and grand ballrooms, right? A priority among the others. Serious vote for tinkering and sketching and making and for play. Forcing memorization of someone else's prior imagination is not the way. The recipe gives space to extend and expand a concept through empathy and understanding, through diversity and collaboration, and embrace an imagination in the case of them all. The more minds that imagine together, the more innovation blossoms. The more diverse these minds, the taller it grows. And if it's fueled by love and understanding, it thrives and soars. We are seven billion brothers and sisters. We can do anything unless we fight each other. Go human or go home. My fellow dreamers, you are our future game changers. Your place is at the top of the class. Take out your wand and cast. <laughs> <laughs> I am always ready. <laughs> Take out your wand and cast the spell of I want that. It's okay if it's messy. We could do a whole panel about how messy my journey has been, right? Practice, rehearse, experiment, and try. Screw up and then rise up. Wield the magic of hope and faith. And know 
that the world may attack your genius now, but love you for it later. Hermione is rising, and her power is limitless, and so is yours. I pray, like her, like me, like everyone on this panel, that you use it for the greater good. God believes in you. Please believe in yourself. Thank you. All right. What? Oh, my goodness. Okay. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. Thank God, I didn't know what the hell that was sticking out the back of that hood. I was like, what? Security? What is going on? What does Tiffany have in the back of her head? Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I was sitting. I was going to run. I'm sitting, I'm sitting next to her. You can imagine. What, what, I was, what the heck? I okay. have had to speak to Secret Service before about the wand, so I didn't get shot. So we have time for a couple questions. I think we have a microphone out there. There it is, there's our microphone. Anybody raise your hand. Yes, yes sir. Can you Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were gonna bring the microphone. I know, I can hear the pipes, man. Um, hello. <laughs> Weird, everybody looking at me. But um, thank you for the panelists. Um, thank you for pouring into me today. I'm going to pull back into you. Don't even worry about that. But um, my name is Dante Tyler. I'm the owner of OQPS, which is a small minority-owned disadvantaged business that aims to close security gaps, and particularly small businesses, by reducing their risk to acceptable levels. So my question to the panelists, as a entrepreneur myself, um, I'm growing my, I'm beginning to scale my business. How do I Build a team, number one, right? Because I've been a, I've at a point now where I'm relinquishing control, right? I've hired a virtual assistant. Um, you know, I had a sales director. You know, I've even got somewhat of a, a business coach. But what I'm really having a trouble with is I recognize um, some of the things that you, the panelists, said up there, like those dreamers. The ones that work beside me on my nine to five, you know, I hear their dreams. I'm like, I see like your aspiration, like you really enjoy data analytics. You know, how do I get them to come on over here? <laughs> I, I don't really know how to ask the question, but get them to not only believe in themselves, but believe in me. Because as an entrepreneur, what I see is everybody trying to build their own boat, right? Which I'm for all that, you know, I'm for everybody having their own boat, but if my boat down the road further a little bit, why don't you just come help push mines? And then in that, I'm gonna pull back into you, you know, that's just the type of guy that I am. So I'm not sure if that's a question if I formulated it good, but I hope I was able to. Um, you did it, you did it. Thank all you. Right, what we got? So, you know, one of the things that I would encourage you to, to recognize very early on is hiring is the most important thing that you'll ever do. It's making sure that you select the right people. But I think that uh, people will join you once they believe in you, as you said. But it, it's about uh, being authentic, right? You know, when you find people that are uh, interested, because people approach me all the time about coming to work with me, right? I'm very selective about the people that I bring into my organization because they represent you, right? But people will become drawn to you, right, when they can, can generally, gen, genuinely understand your mission, your vision, and, you know, determine how they can add value to helping you reach there, right? But you don't want people who want to be you, Right, you know, you, you want to make sure that you, when they, when they tell you that, you, it's important that you, you recognize that. And I don't believe that you can actually, uh, you know, base the long-term sustainability of your organization on somebody that's temporary, right? So I think you had a very critical point right now, and it's very important that as you begin to scale your business that you hire smart. So that means go slow. Right. And so, you know, I made some mistakes in that. Right. So two things that I would say, I would go a little slower and I would hire better. Right. If I could go back 16 years, reverse 16 years, I would go a little slower and I would hire better because in some instances there were people that I hitched my wagon to that I should not have. Right. Because I was trying to scale too fast. So that would be the advice that I would give to you in that respect. 
Another question? Definitely. Um, first off, good morning and thank you so much. I do have to say to um, Tiffany, you would definitely be a Miss HBCU somewhere. <laughs> yeah. um, Where? Tell me. How's that right now? I don't know. The Fairview is where I went to. P please feel free, Fairview <laughs> University. But uh, my question, I'm Osa Davo McCarroll. I have some friends that started a venture capitalist firm, all minority owned. And my question is, most likely to the SPAC, um, how do I help bring other companies into that organization. For my friend who started the venture capitalist firm, we're looking for African-American companies to invest in and continue to grow. And then also, how do I find that? That's, it's, a, it's an area that we're not really familiar with. And my second question for everybody is, when you're building wealth and business, how do you manage with family? That's, that's, that, that, that's a loaded question, but first the first one with the venture capitalist firm and then the second one with the family. So you need a TV show, young fellow. Um, you, you, you'd be good at asking these questions. With, with regard to venture capital, you gotta figure out what it is you want to invest in. What is it that your team has expertise in? What do you have an interest in? If it's food and beverage, uh, if it's technology, if it's, if it's uh, new forms of technology, including the metaverse, if it's consumer products, if it's healthcare, whatever it might be. So I think you, you, you figure out and decide on what it is you want, uh, what you want to invest in. And you go out and you try to find the best people. You find the best partners and others who are investing in the bigger companies or bigger firms or smaller firms and maybe even look at how they're investing in companies they're investing in and invest alongside of them. If you're looking to specifically identify black-owned companies or women-owned companies or Hispanic-owned companies, there are resources for that. I think you can, you can look to some of the, the larger firms that, 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 that partner with uh, minority-owned firms. John Rogers and Melody Hobson and Errol Investments are, are they one of the great, great firms in the country. We've got one of the great ones here in Brown uh, that we, that's already been talked about uh, uh, in, in the conversation for in Houston. Uh, you, you, have, uh, you have a number of firms there as well. So I think it'd be important to look to some of those resources uh, as you think about whether it's a vertical that you're looking at and or it's a, a, a black-owned, woman-owned, Hispanic-owned firm, venture firm, or for that matter, big investment firm, looking at how they've invested over the years. I'll let, I'll let uh, Nicholas deal with the family question. Investment. <laughs> so, um, you know, me, me and my students had a very spirited debate about this whole subject of uh, hiring family in your business. <laughs> And uh, what I will say to you is, is that, um, you know, the, the, the ideally you would love to be able to have your family, um, you know, run your company. And there are a number of examples of that being very successful. Uh, but uh, in some instances, that can be a bit of an anomaly. Uh, from my personal experience, uh, it became that I needed to hire the most qualified people and it was just always awesome if those people were your family. In many instances they were not because sometimes people can't separate the difference between family and business. And so all, that, that can become an Achilles heel, right? And uh, you know, uh, when it's just an idea, right, uh, it's, it, it, it you know can sound wonderful but when there's uh, money on the table, uh, I've also seen uh, where that has become destructive and has uh, drove a wedge between family because people were not upfront about what their expectations were. People had silent expectations. So communicating, I believe, is very important upfront to set very realistic goals upfront, ownership, expectations, equity, how, you know, all of those things in the initial stages that could be very difficult to talk about have to be talked about up front if you're going to do business with family so that everyone has a very clear expectation as to what will happen as my grandmother would say when we laid a hog on the table and then we had to cut it up okay <laughs> so we don't want anybody arguing about somebody getting a little bit larger piece than someone else right and so you know as your organization grows people will be when you look to raise capital and do things people are going to look to see if you have the most qualified uh, people in position to be able to run your company, right? Because you're also, in some instances, going to be competing against other people, and so you want the absolute best talent. Wow, I think we have time for one more question. Now, I'll take the chitlins if we divide up the hog. I'll go ahead and take the chitlins. You big mama cooking them, that's all I'm 
Hello, my name is India Whitlock, and this question is for the ladies only because that's super important to me. And I know we talk about, um, I'm a builder, and I know we talk about spaces that aren't a lot of yardage for um, just African Americans, but there's also a lot of, we don't have a lot of space for like women, you ladies are sitting in these levels of, of power, and I know we also had to navigate through those processes of being with each other in spaces. So I wanted to know from you, how do you leverage those relationships when a lot of times when you're in business with women, we don't want, we, we have a yardage, but we don't want to be in the yard with each other. You know, we walk past each other, we don't even speak to each other, but when we can be that area of opportunity where we can leverage each other and have those courageous conversations where we can all scale and benefit from each other on so many levels. So the question is for you ladies, how do you navigate in that space? And what are your conversations around that um, inability to get along as women in power? You know, I think that is, a, um, and this is just my personal experience, I think that is just one of the greatest fake rumors that was ever put out. I mean, to be honest, I don't, I, don't, I don't actually experience it that much in real life. And unfortunately, every show I watch, I'm 46, and if you were watching, you know, Dynasty or any shows, it, it looked real, like, oh, women must be fighting in the workplace, or it can't be two women at a table. I'm, I'm, our company is 50% women on purpose. We tripled our forecast because of that, not in spite of it. I go out of my way to ensure that we have a balanced place for women because the thing about women is we're not even a minority. Doesn't make sense for it to be 30 of the Fortune 500 CEOs to be women when the math makes no sense. You could just think back to your third grade class. You didn't look around and say like, oh, only one of the girls is smart. At least half of them was, you know what I mean, equivalent to the class. So um, it, it makes no sense um, to not make sure that we're holding hands and progressing together. And in my experience, um, it's been, it's actually been phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, yesterday I was with 10 of just the baddest, most brilliant black women I could uh, imagine. And it was inspiring and we need more of it. And I just think you can't, if we wait for it to happen on accident, or if you're finding the cases where one or two women, we're all still human, right, or you feel like it's negative or they don't have your best interest at heart, it's likely a reflection of their own experience. And I say give them grace. Be extra kind, right? How can you, how can you do everything you can do to help them have the best possible spotlight they can? All you can do is control your behavior. And if there's one or two people who are those outliers, we keep them in prayer, but we don't got to keep them in person. everything she said. <laughs> it is a fallacy. I mean, I have, I'm just starting to work more and more with women, but more because I've been like frontier, high tech, and there wasn't as many women in that space. I am 54. And so as we like, you know, as things go on and on and more and more women get into this space, not because of ability or interest, because it's like we have to get over, over ourselves. Like, it's just learning to code. Like when people would say that and let, let's train more women to, I was like, they know how to code. You're treating people like crap and they don't wanna be bothered staying and being treated like crap. So first off, I will say that is kind of a myth. Um, for me, having you know run a billion dollar, you know, being senior management, a billion dollar company in my late 20s with high tech, I'll tell you like a couple of things I did because to me, the magic word isn't inclusion, the magic word is agency, right? It's not about, include me at your table, please, please, please. It's like, I will own a rickety table and allow you to sit at it. Most of the people I've led have been men, white men, you know, so while, so I would say first shift that mindset to agency and then, you know, like uh, what was said before, it's like, then you be that person. So like with World Space and we were building and launching a size, I was like, God, some black, other black woman needs to be a part of this journey and see it, you know? And um, I wish Patricia was here, we're still close. Maybe a couple of weeks later, a woman had literally walked off the street, no tech experience and was like, what are you guys doing here? So interested in what you're doing and the reception and the receptionist called my office, you know, it was like, there's a young black woman in the lobby that's interested in what we were doing. And, and by the time we were done speaking, I hired her. Because I could, right? Yeah. Or like, um, in the midst of it, it was you know, still male-dominated space, 
a woman in another department was being unfortunately sexually harassed. I won't tell the details of the story because it's her story. And at the time I was traveling a lot around the world and I'd come in one night and she had asked to meet with me and she was like different department, different reporting structure. Back then in the late 90s, you didn't know how someone was gonna respond, including you know, other women because there just wasn't that social context. It was more acceptable, uh, believe it or not. I mean, it was horrible. So she had come to me and said, you know, I wanna tell you about so-and-so. I'm going through all this. She was a single mother and I'm really scared because I feel like he's gonna put, keep pushing. If I don't do anything, he's gonna you know, fire me and I, I need this job and what should I do? And the first thing that I did was hire her, right? So a lot of times we're coaching these women saying, go to the HR and speak to some, but it's like what you were saying, right? Like they have real, she was a single mother back in 1997 with this powerful, you know, white male uh, making advances on her and she knew around society they weren't going to believe her or care. So for me to say, I hear you, let me go, you know, let, let me call HR and have you report, that's not solving the problem, right? So I hired her in my department, which of course then uh, he got mad at me because he knew. And then I said, okay, after that was done, it took us about four days. I said, okay, now you decide if you want to report it or not. But she was in a place of agency. So I would say, and she did report it, and then I immediately took it from there. And eventually, as is the case, we found out there were all these other women at the vendors, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that would be my response. Like, focus on agency, and then you be the person that takes care of the change. Awesome. All right, y'all, give it up for this amazing, esteemed panel. We were here, we witnessed it, we were here on behalf of the CIAA and the City of Baltimore. I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to all our panelists and participants for contributing to this very interesting conversation, centering around topics that changed our life, okay? As a father of three black little girls, I guess they're not little girls anymore, I'm just excited about what the future holds for them. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you everybody for participating. And again, we gotta thank PNC Bank for helping to make this summit possible. Give it up for PNC Bank.